This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. The Blind Owl Sometimes my nurse would talk about the miracles performed by the prophets. Her purpose in so doing was to entertain me, but the only effect was to make me envy her the pettiness and stupidity of her ideas. Sometimes she retailed pieces of gossip. For example, she told me a few days ago that her daughter, meaning the bitch, had made a set of clothes for the baby. Her baby. After which she began to console me in a way that suggested she knew the truth. Sometimes she would fetch me homemade remedies from the neighbors, or she would consult magicians and fortune tellers about my case. On the last Wednesday of the year she went to see one of her fortune tellers and came back with a bowl of onions, rice and rancid oil. She told me she had begged this rubbish from the fortune teller in the hope that it would help me to get better. It is the custom on the last Wednesday before Nuras for people to disguise themselves and go begging. The alms received on this occasion are believed to bring good luck. On the following days she gave it to me in small portions in my food without my knowledge. She also made me swallow at regular intervals the various concoctions prescribed by the doctor, hyssop, extract of licorice, camphor, maidenhair, chamomile, oil of bay, linseed, fir tree nuts, starch, gray powders, and heaven knows how many more varieties of trash. A few days ago she brought me a prayer book with half an inch of dust on it. I had no use, not only for prayer books, but for any sort of literature that expressed the notions of the rabble. What need had I of their nonsense and lies? Was not I myself the result of a long succession of past generations, which had bequeathed their experience to me? Did not the past exist within me? As for mosques, the muezzins call to prayer, the ceremonial washing of the body and rinsing of the mouth, not to mention the pious practice of bobbing up and down in honor of a high and mighty being, the omnipotent Lord of all things with whom it was impossible to have a chat except in the Arabic language. language. These things left me completely cold. Earlier, in the days before I fell ill, I had been to the mosque a number of times, always more or less unwillingly. On these occasions I had tried to enter into a community of feeling with the people around me. But my eye would rest on the shining, pattern tiles on the wall, and I would be transported into a delightful dream world. Thereby I unconsciously provided myself with a way of escape. During the prayers I would shut my eyes and cover my face with my hand, and in this artificial night of my own making I would recite the prayers like the meaningless sounds uttered by someone who is dreaming. The words were not spoken from the heart. I found it pleasanter to talk to a friend or acquaintance than to God, the High and Mighty One. God was too important a personage for me. When I was lying in my warm, damp bed these questions did not interest me one jot, and at such a time it did not matter to me whether God really existed, or whether he was nothing but a personification of the mighty ones of this world, invented for the greater glory of spiritual values, and the easier spoliation of the lower orders, the pattern of earthly things being transferred to the sky. All that I wanted to know was whether or not I was going to live through to the morning. In face of death I felt that religion, faith, belief were feeble, childish things of which the best that could be said was that they provided a kind of recreation for healthy, successful people. In face of the frightful reality of death, and of my own desperate condition, 
all that had been inculcated into me on the subject of judgment day, and rewards, and penalties in a future life seemed an insipid fraud, and the prayers I had been taught were completely ineffective against the fear of death. No, the fear of death would not let me go. People who have not known suffering themselves will not understand me when I say that my attachment to life had grown so strong that the least moment of ease compensated for long hours of palpitation and anguish. I saw that pain and disease existed, and at the same time that they were void of sense and meaning. Among the men of the rabble I had become a creature of a strange, unknown race, so much so that they had forgotten that I had once been part of their world. I had the dreadful sensation that I was not really alive or wholly dead. I was a living corpse, unrelated to the world of living people, and at the same time deprived of the oblivion and peace of death. It was night when I stood up from beside my opium brazier. I looked out of the window. A single black tree was visible beside the shuttered butcher's shop. The shadows had merged into one black mass. I felt as though everything in the world was hollow and provisional. The pitch black sky reminded me of an old black tent, in which the countless shining stars represented holes. As I watched I heard from somewhere the voice of a muezzin, although it was not the time for the call to prayer. It sounded like the cry of a wo woman. It could have been the bitch. In the pangs of childbirth, mingled with the cry, the cry was the sound of a dog howling. I thought to myself, if it is true that everyone has his own star in the sky mine must be remote, dark and meaningless. Perhaps I have never had a star at all. Just then the voices of a band of drunken policemen rose loud from the street. As they marched by they were joking obscenely among themselves. Then they began to sing in chorus, Come, let us go and drink wine. Let us drink wine of the kingdom of Ray. If we do not drink now, when should we drink? In terror I shrank back from the window. Their voices resounded strangely through the night air, gradually growing fainter and fainter. No, they were not coming for me, they did not know. Silence and darkness settled down upon the world again. I did not light my oil lamp. It was more pleasant to sit in the dark, that dense liquid which permeates everything and every place. I had grown accustomed to the dark. It was in the dark that my lost thoughts, my forgotten fears, the frightful, unbelievable ideas that had been lurking in some unknown recess of my brain, used to return to life, to move about, and to grimace at me. In the corners of my room, behind the curtains, beside the door, were hosts of these ideas, of these formless, menacing figures. There, beside the curtain, sat one fearful shape. It never stirred, it was neither gloomy nor cheerful. Every time I came back to my room it gazed steadily into my eyes. Its face was familiar to me. It seemed to me that I had seen that face at some time in my childhood. Yes, it was on the thirteenth day of Nuras. I was playing hide-and-seek with some other children on the bank of the river Saran, when I caught sight of that same face amid a crowd of other, ordinary faces set on top of funny, reassuring little bodies. It reminded me of the butcher opposite the window of my room. I felt that this shape had its place in my life, and that I had seen it often before. Perhaps this shadow had been born along with me and moved within the restricted circuit of my existence. As soon as I stood up to light the lamp the shape faded and disappeared. I stood in front of the mirror and stared at my face. 
The reflection that I saw was unfamiliar to me. It was a weird, frightening image. My reflection had become stronger than my real self, and I had become like an image in a mirror. I felt that I could not remain alone in the same room with my reflection. I was afraid that if I tried to run away he would come after me. We were like two cats face to face, preparing to do battle. But I knew that I could create my own complete darkness with the hollow of my palm, and I raised my hand and covered my eyes. The sensation of horror as usual aroused in me a feeling of exquisite, intoxicating pleasure, which made my head swim, and my knees give way, and filled me with nausea. Suddenly I realized that I was still standing. The circumstance struck me as odd, even inexplicable. How could it have come about that I was standing on my feet? It seemed to me that if I were to move one of my feet I should lose my balance. A kind of vertigo took possession of me. The earth and everything upon it had receded infinitely far from me. I wished vaguely for an earthquake or a thunderbolt from the sky, which would make it possible for me to be born again, a world of light and peace. When at last I went back to bed, I said to myself, death, death. My lips were closed, yet I was afraid of my voice. I had quite lost my previous boldness. I had become like the flies which crowd indoors at the beginning of the autumn, thin, half-dead flies which are afraid at first of the buzzing of their own wings and cling to some one point of the wall until they realize that they are alive, then they fling themselves recklessly against door and walls until they fall dead around the floor. As my eyes closed a dim, indistinct world began to take shape around me. It was a world of which I was the sole creator, and which was in perfect harmony with my vision of reality. At all events it was far more real and natural to me than my waking world and presented no obstacle, no barrier, to my ideas. In it time and place lost their validity. My repressed lusts, my secret needs, which had begotten this dream, gave rise to shapes and to happenings which were beyond belief, but which seemed natural to me. For a few moments after waking up I had no sense of time or place and doubted whether I really existed. It would seem that I myself created all my dreams and had long known the correct interpretation of them. A great part of the night had passed by the time I fell asleep. All at once I found myself wandering free and unconstrained through an unknown town, along streets lined with weird houses of geometrical shapes, prisms, cones, cubes, with low, dark windows and doors and walls overgrown with vines of morning glory. All the, the inhabitants of the town had died by some strange death. Each and every one of them was standing motionless, with two drops of blood from his mouth congealed upon his coat. When I touched one of them his head toppled and fell to the ground. I came to a butcher's shop and saw there a man like the odds and ends man in front of our house. He had a scarf wrapped around his neck and held a long-bladed knife in his hand and he stared at me with red eyes from which the lids seemed to have been cut off. I tried to take the knife from his hand. His head toppled and fell to the ground. I fled in terror. As I ran along the streets everyone I saw was standing motionless. When I reached my father-in-law's house my brother-in-law, the bitch's little brother, was sitting on the stone bench outside. I put my hand into my pocket, took out a pair of cakes and tried to put them into his hand, but the moment I touched him his head toppled and fell to the ground. I shrieked aloud and awoke. The room was still half dark. 
My heart was beating hard. I felt as if the ceiling were weighing down upon my head, and the walls had grown immensely thick and threatened to crush me. My eyes had become dim. I lay for some time in terror, counting and recounting the uprights of the walls. I had hardly shut my eyes when I heard a noise. It was Nanny, who had come to tidy up the room. She had laid breakfast for me in a room in the upper story. I went upstairs and sat down by the sash window. From up there the old odds and ends man in front of my window was out of sight, but I could see the butcher over on the left. His movements which, seen from my own window, seemed heavy, deliberate and frightening, now struck me as helpless, even comical. I felt that this man had no business to be a butcher at all, and was only acting a part. A man led up the two gaunt, black horses with their deep, hollow cough. Each of them had a pair of sheep carcasses slung across its back. The butcher ran his greasy hand over his mustache and appraised the carcasses with a buyer's eye. Then, with an effort, he carried two of them across and hung them from the hook at the entrance to the shop. I saw him pat their legs. I have no doubt that when he stroked his wife's body at night he would think of the sheep and reflect how much he could make if he were to kill his wife. When the tidying up was finished I went back to my room and made a resolution, a frightful resolution. I went into the little closet off my room and took out a bone-handled knife, which I kept in a box there. I wiped the blade on the skirt of my caftan and hid it under the pillow. I had made this resolution a long time before, but there had been something just now in the movements of the butcher as he cut up the legs of the sheep, weighed out the meat, and then looked around with an expression of self-satisfaction which somehow made me want to imitate him. This was a pleasure that I too must experience. I could see from my window a patch of perfect, deep blue in the midst of the clouds. It seemed to me that I should have to climb a very long ladder to reach that patch of sky. The horizon was covered with thick, yellow, deathly clouds which weighed heavily upon the whole city. It was horrible, delicious weather. For some reason which I cannot explain I crouched down to the floor. In this kind of weather I always tended to think of death. But it was only now, when death, his face smeared with blood, was clutching my throat with his bony hands, that I made up my mind. I made up my mind to take the bitch with me, to prevent her from saying when I had gone, God have mercy on him, his troubles are over. A funeral procession passed by in front of my window. The coffin was draped with black, and a lighted candle stood upon it. My ear caught the cry, La ilaha el Allah, there is no God but God, part of the Muslim profession of faith. All the tradespeople and the passers-by left whatever they were doing and walked seven paces after the coffin. Even the butcher came out, walked the regulation seven paces after the coffin and returned to his shop. But the old peddler man did not stir from his place beside his wares. How serious everybody suddenly looked. Doubtless their thoughts had turned abruptly to the subject of death and the afterlife. When my nurse brought me my medicine I observed that she looked thoughtful. She was fingering the beads of a large rosary and was muttering some formula to herself. Then she took up her position outside my door, beat her breast and recited her prayers in a loud voice, My God! My God! Anyone might have thought it was my business to pardon the living. All this buffoonery left me completely cold. 
It actually gave me a certain satisfaction to think that, for a few seconds at any rate, the rabble men were undergoing, temporarily and superficially, it is true, something of what I was suffering. Was not my room a coffin? This bed that was always unrolled, inviting me to sleep, was it not colder and darker than the grave? The thought that I was lying in a coffin had occurred to me several times. At night my room seemed to contract and to press against my body. May it not be that people have this same sensation in the grave? Is anything definite known about the sensations we may experience after death? True, the blood ceases to circulate, and after the lapse of 24 hours certain parts of the body begin to decompose. Nevertheless the hair and the nails continue to grow for some time after death. Do sensation and thought cease as soon as the heart has stopped beating? Or do they continue a vague existence, alimented by the blood still remaining in the minor blood vessels? The fact of dying is a fearful thing in itself, but the consciousness that one is dead would be far worse. Some old men die with a smile on their lips like people passing from sleep into a deeper sleep, or like a lamp burning out. What must be the sensations of a young, strong man who dies suddenly, and who continues for some time longer to struggle against death with all the strength of his being? I had many times reflected on the fact of death, and on the decomposition of the component parts of my body, so that this idea had ceased to frighten me. On the contrary, I genuinely longed to pass into oblivion and non-being. The only thing I feared was that the atoms of my body should later go to make up the bodies of rabble men. This thought was unbearable to me. There were times when I wished I could be endowed after death with large hands with long, sensitive fingers, I would carefully collect together all the atoms of my body and hold them tightly in my hands to prevent them, my property, from passing into the bodies of rabble men. Sometimes I imagined that the visions I saw were those which appeared to everyone who was at the point of death. All anxiety, awe, fear and will to live had subsided within me, and my renunciation of the religious beliefs, which had been inculcated into me in my childhood had given me an extraordinary inner tranquility. What comforted me was the prospect of oblivion after death. The thought of an afterlife frightened and fatigued me. I had never been able to adapt myself to the world in which I was now living. Of what use would another world be to me? I felt that this world had not been made for me, but for a tribe of brazen, money-grubbing, blustering louts, sellers of conscience, hungry of eye and heart. Heart. For people, in fact, who had been created in its own likeness, and who fawned and groveled before the mighty of earth and heaven, as the hungry dog outside the butcher's shop wagged his tail, in the hope of receiving a fragment of awful. The thought of an afterlife frightened and fatigued me. No, I had no desire to see all these loathsome worlds peopled with repulsive feces. Was God such a parvenu that he insisted on my looking over his collection of worlds? I must speak as I think. If I had to go through another life, then I hoped that my mind and senses would be numb. In that event I could exist without effort and weariness. I would live my life in the shadow of the columns of some lingam temple. I would retire into some corner where the light of the sun would never strike my eyes, and the words of men, and the noise of life never grate upon my ears. I retired as deep as I could into the depths of my own being like an animal that hides itself in a cave in the winter time. I heard other people's voices with my ears, my own I heard in my throat. 
The solitude that surrounded me was like the deep, dense night of eternity, that night of dense, clinging, contagious darkness which awaits the moment when it will descend upon silent cities full of dreams of lust and rancor. From the viewpoint of this throat with which I had identified myself, I was nothing more than an insane abstract mathematical demonstration. The pressure which, in the act of procreation, holds together two people who are striving to escape from their solitude, is the result of this same streak of madness, which exists in every person, mingled with regret at the thought that he is slowly sliding towards the abyss of death. Only death does not lie. The presence of death annihilates all superstitions. We are the children of death, and it is death that rescues us from the deceptions of life. In the midst of life he calls us and summons us to him. At an age when we have not yet learnt the language of men if at times we pause in our play, it is that we may listen to the voice of death. Throughout our life death is beckoning to us. Has it not happened to everyone suddenly, without reason, to be plunged into thought and to remain immersed so deeply in it as to lose consciousness of time and place and the working of his own mind? At such times one has to make an effort in order to perceive and recognize again the phenomenal world in which men live. One has been listening to the voice of death. Lying in this damp, sweaty bed, as my eyelids grew heavy, and I longed to surrender myself to non-being and everlasting night, I felt that my lost memories and forgotten fears were all coming to life again fear lest the feathers in my pillow should turn into dagger blades or the buttons on my coat expand to the size of millstones, fear lest the breadcrumbs that fell to the floor should shatter into fragments like pieces of glass, apprehension lest the oil in the lamp should spill during my sleep and set fire to the whole city, anxiety lest the paws of the dog outside the butcher's shop should ring like horses' hoofs as they struck the ground, dread lest the old odds and ends man sitting behind his wares should burst into laughter and be unable to stop, fear lest the worms in the footbath by. I used to try to recall the days of my childhood, but when I succeeded in doing so, and experienced that time again it was as grim and painful as the present. Other things which brought their contribution of anxiety and fear were my coughing, which sounded like that of the gaunt, black horses in front of the butcher's shop, my spitting, and the fear lest the phlegm should someday reveal a streak of blood, the tepid, salty liquid which rises from the depths of the body, the juice of life, which we must vomit up in the end, and the continuous menace of death, which smashes forever the fabric of the mind and passes on. Life as it proceeds reveals, coolly and dispassionately, what lies behind the mask that each man wears. It would seem that every one possesses several faces. Some people use only one all the time, and it then, naturally, becomes soiled and wrinkled. These are the thrifty sort. Others look after their masks in the hope of passing them on to their descendants. Others again are constantly changing their faces. But all of them, when they reach old age, realize one day that the mask they are wearing is their last, and that it will soon be worn out, and then, from behind the last mask, the real face appears. The walls of my room must have contained some virus that poisoned all my thoughts. I felt sure that before me some murderer, some diseased madman, had lived in it. Not only the walls of the room itself, but the view from the window, the butcher, the old odds and ends man, my nurse, the bitch and everyone whom I used to see, even the bowl from which I ate my barley broth and the clothes that I wore, all these had conspired together to engender such thoughts in my brain. 
A few nights ago when I took off my clothes in a cubicle at the bathhouse my thoughts took a new direction. As the attendant poured water over my head I felt as though my black thoughts were being washed away. I observed my shadow on the steamy wall of the bathhouse. I saw that I was as frail and thin as I had been ten years earlier, when I was a child. Then I remembered distinctly that my shadow had fallen then in just the same way on the wet wall of the bathhouse. I looked down at my body. There was something lascivious and yet hopeless in the look of my thighs, calves and loins. Their shadow too had not changed since ten years before, when I was only a child. I felt that my whole life had passed without purpose or meaning like the flickering shadows on the bathhouse wall. Other people were massive, solid, thick-necked. Doubtless the shadows they cast on the steamy wall of the bathhouse were bigger and denser, and left their imprint for some moments after they had gone, whereas mine was effaced instantaneously. When I had finished dressing after the bath my gestures and thoughts seemed to change again. It was as though I had entered a different world, as though I had been born again in the old world that I detested. At all events I could say that I had acquired a new life, for it seemed a miracle to me that I had not dissolved in the bath like a lump of salt. My life appeared to me just as strange, as unnatural, as inexplicable, as the picture on the pen case that I am using this moment as I write. I feel that the design on the lid of this pen case must have been drawn by an artist in the grip of some mad obsession. Often when my eye lights on this picture it strikes me as somehow familiar. Perhaps this picture is the reason why. Perhaps it is this picture that impels me to write. It represents a cypress tree at the foot of which is squatting a bent old man like an Indian fakir. He has a long cloak wrapped about him, and he is wearing a turban on his head. The index finger of his left hand is pressed to his lips in a gesture of surprise. Before him a girl in a long black dress is dancing. Her movements are not those of ordinary people, she could be Bugam Desai. She is holding a flower of morning glory in her hand. Between them runs a little stream. I was sitting beside my opium brazier. All my dark thoughts had dissolved and vanished in the subtle heavenly smoke. My body was meditating, my body was dreaming and gliding through space. It seemed to have been released from the burden and contamination of the lower air and to be soaring in an unknown world of strange colors and shapes. The opium had breathed its vegetable soul, its sluggish, vegetable soul, into my frame, and I lived and moved in a world of vegetable existence. But as, with my cloak over my shoulders, I drowsed beside the leather ground sheet on which my brazier stood, the thought of the old odds and ends man for some reason came to my mind. He used to sit huddled up beside his wares in the same posture as I was then in. The thought struck me with horror. I rose, threw off the cloak, and stood in front of the mirror. My cheeks were inflamed to the color of the meat that hangs in front of butchers' shops. My beard was disheveled. And yet there was something immaterial, something fascinating, in the reflection that I saw. The eyes wore an expression of weariness and suffering like those of a sick child. It was as though everything that was heavy, earthy and human in me had melted away. This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Anchor. Breaker. Overcast. Pocket Casts. Radio Public. Spotify. Support us on Patreon. And check us out on Discord. 
All the links can be found in the video description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.